Tonight, I'm going to title this message. It's kind of an unusual title called The Bloodline of the Beast. The Bloodline of the Beast. And you may say, what are you talking about? Well, what I'm going to deal with is radical Islam and the rise of what is called in the Bible the Beast Kingdom. If you have a Bible, Revelation chapter 13, Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. I think it may come up on the screen, but let me read to you what John saw in the apocalypse. The apocalypse is the unveiling of something which is here, the book of Revelation. I stood up on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the names of, name of blasphemy. The beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear. And his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, and if you check out Revelation 12, the dragon is Satan, gave him his power, his seat, and that word is thronos there. It means the throne he's sitting on, the authority, and gave him his great authority. In other words, the authority over the entire earth. Now, I want to break this down for you in just kind of a simple paragraph here. According to everything the Bible teaches in Daniel, the book of Revelation, the book of Zechariah concerning the time of the end, the time prior to Jesus' return, this is what's about to happen. There's going to be a final world kingdom that's going to arise. And this kingdom will be divided into two sections, into two halves, and I'll mention this in a moment. One is called a seventh empire that will rule for 42 months approximately immediately followed by an eighth empire, which is going to rule again for a period of about 42 months. This is where we come up with the thought of the seven-year tribulation, which I'll deal with in a moment. The most dangerous empire that has ever been in the history of the world will be the eighth empire, which is coming in the future. Because according to the prophets of the Bible, it is a warlike empire. In fact, in the book of Revelation, it keeps saying, who can make war against the beast? The beast, of course, is a name. In Greek, it's therion, and it means a wild beast. And so this kingdom is is, is like a wild animal, an untamed wild animal. And this is one of the reasons that the metaphor of the word of a beast of some kind is used for this final empire. Uh, For example, this empire will behead people who do not follow its religion. This empire will attempt to control all buying and selling to where you cannot buy food or sell anything you have unless you have a mark and the name and the number of the beast. That's in Revelation 13 verse 18. So what I'd like to do is basically share with you that this empire that John saw in Revelation 13 is actually a combination of three empires of past Bible prophecy. And it's odd that these three areas I'm going to show you tonight happen to be the areas where not only Muslims rule, but the area where some of the strongest radical Muslims in the world rule. So therefore, the beast of Revelation chapter 13, 1 through 2, in my opinion, I think I can prove that in the next 50 minutes or so, is an Islamic kingdom which, in which the Muslims are going to reform a caliphate, which is a, 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 an empire. We, they use that word. We would use the word empire to try to attempt to convert the world to Islam eventually and also eventually rule the world, especially the area of the Middle East and parts of Europe. Now, that's a mouthful, but let's talk about three terms. What I want to talk about, first of all, is the term tribulation. The second term is the term antichrist. And the third term that I will go into more explanation concerning is the beast itself, which is the kingdom itself. First, how many of you have ever heard the word tribulation? Raise your hand if you've heard the word. How many of you kind of know what it means, but may not know a lot about what it means? Can you raise your hand? I'd love to explain this to you. Good. Let me explain to you what the tribulation is. The tribulation is a time period at the very end of days when the greatest stress and trouble that has ever been in world history occurs over a period of several years. As a matter of fact, the Old Testament prophets saw it in this term, the day of the Lord. Throughout the Old Testament, you will read the phrase, and the day of the Lord is coming with darkness, and the day of the Lord is coming with vengeance, and the day of the Lord is coming with gloominess, and the day of the Lord is coming. And it's really negative. When you see these phrases, the day of the Lord, they're pretty negative in a lot of prophecies. Now, in other prophecies, they're positive because there is a day of the Lord of trouble, then there is a day of the Lord when the Lord rules. So if the prophet is talking about the day of the Lord when Jesus is ruling, we call that the millennial reign, Revelation 20, it's always a positive verse. The lion will lay down beside the lamb in the day of the Lord. A man will not die before he's 100 years of age in the day of the Lord. Those are the day of the Lord when Jesus is ruling on earth. But the verses where he's not ruling before he comes back are almost all all bad, negative, cosmic activity. Isaiah talks about the earth gets moved you know, uh, off of its rotation and off of its tilt and the stars are falling from heaven. And it really looks like a gloomy time. And to be quite honest with you, it's a very gloomy time for at least 
a seven-year period, but mostly a 42-month period. We'll talk about that in a moment. So where do we get the idea of a seven-year tribulation? How many of you have ever heard there's a seven-year tribulation coming? Raise your hand because I'd like to tell you where, where it originates. It originates in the prophecy of Daniel. It's in Daniel chapter 9. And in Daniel chapter 9, what Daniel does is he gives the Jewish people a time frame of what's going to happen up until the Messiah is cut off, and that would be the crucifixion of Jesus. And then he talks about a final seven years. Now, the verse is Daniel 9, verse 27. Now, instead of me going to there and trying to read that, let me just quote it to you. He will confirm a covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he will cause the sacrifice to cease. Let's just stop right there. What's it talking about? In the he the book of Daniel, uh, parts of it was written in Aramaic and parts in Hebrew. In the Hebrew, where it talks about the Antichrist, this man which is coming, that's who it's talking about there, will make an agreement for seven. It's not seven days. The week there, one week is not seven days. It's a Hebrew word meaning seven years. So let's just say it this way. And there's a man coming. He's going to make a covenant with Israel for seven years. But in the middle of the seven years, he breaks the covenant. So where do we get the idea of seven years? First of all, we get the idea of seven years from Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Daniel says in Daniel 12 and 1, there'll be a time of trouble. He uses the phrase trouble there, such as was not since there was a nation or ever shall be during that seven-year period. Now, when we also look at Matthew chapter 24, 21, Jesus said, then shall be great tribulation, and it's going to be a time such as, again, was not nor ever shall be. In fact, let me tell you how bad it gets the last 42 months. It gets it's so bad that Jesus said, except the days are shortened, there'd be no flesh saved, but for the elect's sake, sake, he will shorten the days. Meaning, if I let it go on, they'd be killing each other. Nuclear explosion, neutron bombs, all these plagues, but I'm going to just cut it short, bring the Messiah back, and put a stop to everything. All right? So that's what he meant there when he said that. Now, another reference, and I want to I show you this by the board, because in the book of Revelation, because some people think that Daniel 9, 27, it's not for us to day it was fulfilled at the crucifixion they get into all this crazy stuff but go to the book of revelation because the book of revelation is a companion to the book of daniel it mentions 1260 days and then it mentions 42 months all right and there are two references and if i misspell while i'm talking then that's just normal because it's hard to do all right here's 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 the issue daniel 9 27 is a period of seven years and it says that in the midst of the seven, in the middle of the seven, the Antichrist breaks covenant. And here's what you've got in the book of Revelation. You have chapter 1, which is a revelation of Christ. Just read the whole thing. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. You have chapters 2 through 3, which is a message to the churches that existed in John's day, seven churches of Asia. But in chapter 4, there's this huge shifting where John hears a voice saying, Come up here, come up to the throne of God. From chapter 4 all the way through chapter 19, you have what is called the time of tribulation. And, and then what is interesting, and again, if, I pardon if I misspell, but me trying to type and misspell is very difficult if, unless I'm, uh, you know, just stopping talking. So if you look at this, here's what begins to happen. From chapter 4 to chapter 19 would be the seven years of tribulation. Chapter 4, Revelation, because in chapter 4, John's caught up to heaven. That's a picture of the rapture of the church. And so from that point on, you see vile judgments, you see trumpet judgments, you see seals broken with judgments. And this is where the, the seven years come in. Now, in Revelation chapter 11, it tells you that the Antichrist, uh, there's two witnesses that come during, in, during the first part of the of the tribulation. So the first part's three and a half years. The second part is three and a half years. Now, during this first part, here's what has happened. And I'm going to give you my theory, and there will be people here that will disagree with me on this, and I've got even close friends that disagree with me on the timing of the rapture. But I put the rapture at about Revelation chapter 4 at the end of the church age. When the church age is completed, when he's finished with the church, the church age is called the dispensation of the grace of God in the New Testament. That's where we're at right now. When the dispensation of God's grace ends, tribulation begins. So in Chapter 4, we're raptured out. Now, for three and a half years, here's what happens. We are in heaven during that time. Chapter 5 to 6, we're worshiping the Lamb. Chapter 7, there's a great multitude that appears that have been martyred in the tribulation whose souls are appearing in heaven. But in chapter 11, in chapter 11, there's the bema called the judgment seat of Christ. Here's basically what's happening. We're raptured out in chapter 4, and by chapter 11, of chapter 11, you're coming to the three and a half year tribulation that has been going on on the earth. For example, the rapture of the church 
would be about the time frame of the beginning of the seven years. Is everybody with me? That's the beginning. So for three and a half years in heaven, we are worshiping. And by chapter 11, we're at the beam of receiving rewards. You can read that in Revelation chapter 11, verse 18. Now has come the time to reward the saints and the prophets and them that fear the Lord. So we will be in heaven. Now I'm talking about the church, the called out ones, the ones that have been faithful to God, who have been resurrected, called out. We'll be there. Now what happens is... On earth, that's heaven, but on earth from chapter 4 to chapter 11, if you'll read it, Jesus starts breaking the seven-sealed book and there's hell breaking loose. I mean, there's a white horse rider coming with false peace. And then peace is taken from the earth with another horse. And a famine strikes the earth and a third of the people are killed. So all of a sudden on earth, I mean, hell is breaking loose with famines and pestilence and disease and war. And it's absolutely going crazy. And what happens is God sends two witnesses. One of them will be the prophet Elijah who never died. This is in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. It says he's coming back. The other one, I think, is Enoch. The Bible says in Genesis 5, Enoch, the seventh friend from Adam, never died. He was caught up to the Lord alive. The early fathers said that these two witnesses, now again, they're mentioned in Revelation 11, that these two witnesses are going to preach on earth for 42 months. So in other words, the first half of the tribulation on earth, you have the two witnesses preaching. Does this make sense to everybody? So they're not in America preaching, by the way. They are in Israel preaching. And when they're in Israel preaching, they start converting all these Jewish men. All these Jewish people start following them. And there's a total of 144,000 Jewish men who are going to be sealed with the seal of God that the Antichrist, no judgment, nothing can touch them because they have a seal of God on them. And so they're going to be on earth for the first three, three and a half years. The two witnesses are on earth for the first three and a half years. Now let's go back to Daniel 9.27. In Daniel 9.27 it says, in the midst of the seven years, this person who is coming breaks the covenant. Where do you see that at? Watch this now. It's in Revelation 11, Revelation 12, Revelation 13. Now everything I'm just showing you here is in what's called mid-trib, middle of the tribulation, between, watch this, this time frame and this time frame. The first three and a half years being the first part of the tribulation, the last three and a half years being the last part. Everybody still with me? Shout yes. yes. So now what we're going to talk about is the transition between this three and a half and this three and a half. Because first of all, you got to understand something. In the book of Revelation 17 and 18, and I'm really I'm, I'm going to do this more in story form than I would. If I was at one of my conferences, man, we'd be, you know, but I have so many people here that all this is new to, so I'm going to do it more in story form to help you to understand it. What happens is this, that the tribulation being seven years in length, but the Antichrist does something in the middle of the seven to break all the covenant with the Jews. Now, here's the picture. In Revelation 11, these two witnesses, I'm going to just say Enoch and Elijah, have been on earth for three and a half years. All of a sudden, the Antichrist comes in, and he's able to do something nobody else was able to do. Everybody who tried to touch these men, fire came out of heaven and killed them. Muslims are very, 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 very fearful of the judgment of God. No Muslim will be touching these two witnesses as long as fire is coming out of heaven. They are terrified of them. However, these two witnesses do something, and I wish I had time to go in more detail of this. This is very detailed. It's another message. They will help rebuild a Jewish temple. This is in 2 Thessalonians 2, Matthew chapter 24, Revelation 11. They will help build a Jewish temple on the temple mount in Jerusalem and that's what causes the problem. You want to hear something really weird? You ready? Hello? Okay. Since Enoch and Elijah come at the beginning of the three and a half years, a professor at the Hebrew University researched this and said, how long would it take the Jews to rebuild a Jewish temple on the Temple Mount? It wouldn't take long for the building, but they have to have a red heifer. They have to burn the red heifer. They have to have the ashes of the heifer to sanctify all the furniture. I mean, they have, they're going to, if these are Jewish guys, they're going to do it by the law of Moses, okay? Now watch this. They have to pray certain prayers during new moons. Certain prayers during Sabbath. Certain Asher Kaufman told Mike Coleman, from the moment we start the temple... It would be dedicated <clears throat> three and one half years later at Passover. All right, now get the picture. Here's why the Antichrist goes to Jerusalem. Because there's an Alaska mosque and a Dome of the Rock there that's Muslim. And if these Jewish people during the first three and a half years have built a temple presence on the Temple Mount, and they have to go through all the rituals, because what did Jesus say about Elijah? He said, Elijah must first come and restore all things. 
Oh, I wish I had time to preach the rebuilding of the temple. It'd take me another hour to show you the verses. But watch, I'm going to keep it simple. So what happens is they go to dedicate this temple on the Temple Mount after three and a half years on Passover and the Antichrist gets into Jerusalem. Read it in Revelation 11. He kills the two witnesses, slays them, kills them. Why does he kill them? Because he, they, according to the Antichrist, if he's a Muslim, they have desecrated a holy site of Islam, which is the Temple Mount. Hello? Does this make sense to anybody? So in other words, what's happening with the Antichrist invading, it's not just he wants to invade Jerusalem. He said, I'm going to invade Israel. He's doing it because the Temple Mount, ladies and gentlemen, to Muslims, is the third holiest site in all of Islam. Mecca is the first. Medina is the second. That's in Saudi Arabia. But this is the, this is the third holiest site. And so they are still afraid. Listen, Yasser Arafat took a picture that the Temple Mount Faithful took in which they took the dome off and put a new Jewish temple in. He held it up on the news in Indonesia and said the Jews are trying to destroy the dome of the rock to build a temple. This is real serious in the Islamic world about the Jews rebuilding a temple. All right, let's go back over here. So what happens is this. Revelation 11 is at the end of the three and a half years in which the two witnesses are killed. But God does this crazy thing after their body's been on the, on the ground for three and a half days. He raises them back up from the dead and they shoot back into heaven. Hello, how you like that? I'll shake somebody up. Then, then an earthquake happens that kills 7,000 people. Hey, hello. All right. Now, then that takes you to chapter 12. What's happening in chapter 12 now? Jesus told the Jews in Matthew 24, when you see the abomination that makes Jerusalem desolate, and if you want to know what that is, they're going to create an image to the Antichrist and make it speak and live. The Greek word is icon in Revelation 13. It's going to spook the Jews. They're going to leave. They're going to get out. So what happens in chapter 12, the whole story of chapter 12 is Israel flee, a remnant of Jews fleeing into the wilderness, probably the country of Jordan, which is next to Israel, probably the city of Petra, which is a city located in the mountains. It's got, look it up on the internet if you've never seen it. It's an old, old, ancient city where the stones are carved and you could live in, inside the rocks and this is where a lot of scholars think the Jews will flee so in chapter 12 the Jews are fleeing from the Antichrist out of Jerusalem watch what happens in chapter 13 then in chapter 13 you see the beast that's like a bear and a leopard and a lion that suddenly rises so here's what's happened Woo, this is good stuff right here. I'm, making, I'm preaching myself happy right now is everybody keeping up with it so far pretty much because I don't want to get complicated. I want to keep this simple where everybody can get it. Because so we're talking about a seven-year tribulation. All right. So what happens is the first three and a half years, we are in heaven. And we come up to chapter 11, verse 18. This is what's called the Bema or the judgment seat of Christ where we get our crowns and rewards. That's, that's in your Bible in Revelation 11, 18. So we're in heaven. These people that say, oh, we're going to go through all the tribulation. What do you do with Revelation 11, 18? We are in heaven getting rewards. We're not on the earth going through the tribulation. Oh, come on and preach that. Okay. Now, during the first three and a half years, there's what I call, I feel like Glenn Beck every time I get a board up here like this. There's a seventh empire. and then, <laughs> Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Say, that. say that in the microphone, if you will, please. No, I'm just kidding. Now, so here's what's happened. The first three and a half years, there's a seventh empire. And your Bible says in the book of Revelation, it continues a short space. All right? But then the Antichrist, this is in your Bible, the book of Revelation, he forms an eighth. The beast that was and is not yet is, he is the eighth, and he is, he is out of one of the seven. Oh, so I'm, let's just do this right here. Well, I wish I could write neater. So here's here. So now, two things. We are in heaven the entire seven years. If, if I'm correct on leaving at chapter 4 1, and I'm not going to be dogmatic, but if I'm correct on that, we're in heaven the entire seven years. Now, we being the overcomers who have looked for the Lord, who believe He's coming, who've been serving God. Ain't, ain't, hey, listen, there ain't every hypocrite going to heaven. Come on, somebody. You read your Bible, there's five virgins that had no oil. They remain on earth. There's an unprofitable servant cast into outer darkness. I mean, you got to be doing some serving God. Come on, some serving God, being faithful, hanging on, coming to the house of God, witnessing, just doing, just doing the things of God. But watch this. The entire seven years we're in heaven. So let's, let's eliminate us. Let's talk about the folks that aren't there for a minute. So a seventh empire forms the first 42 months. And I believe it's connected to the uh, EU and the common market and a reformation of the old Roman Empire. But in the middle, and this is where most prophets, I don't understand this. I got some great prophets. All the guys that preach prophecy on TV, I know them personally. I've talked to them, been in meetings with them. 
I can't see why they, they've never, they just don't talk about this. There is in mid-trib, after the, after the Antichrist gets into Jerusalem, and he gets into Jerusalem in chapter 11, and it says, measure the temple of God and they that worship, but leave out the outer court for it's given to the Gentiles, and they'll trample the city under their feet for 42 months. Revelation 11 verse 2. So somebody's going to have to invade in mid-trib. But what happens is we come into the person of the Antichrist. All right? Now, I'm going to give you some scriptures here. I'm going to go back to the pulpit to give you some scriptures. Now, how many of you have ever heard the name Antichrist? I bet everybody in this building knows it. Heard it. How many of you have never heard the words? Anybody that's just never heard that before? See, about everybody here has heard the name Antichrist. Now, the Antichrist was responsible for helping to make a treaty for seven years. Okay? Um, let me give you a nugget. I was with Benny Hinn years ago on TV, and I told Benny this, and he was like, oh, oh, brother. You know how he does. He's got that little accent. And he talked to me. He said, brother, this is amazing. He says, I've never saw that before. There's a war coming. Now, we're going to do a rabbit trail. Everybody say, this is a Perry Stone rabbit trail. Come on, these are good. The rabbit trails are good. There's a war coming. It's not going to come anytime soon, but you can see it building for it, and it's called the War of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. It involves Iran, which in the Bible is called Persia, it involves Libya, it involves Ethiopia, it involves uh, Tugarma, it involves, uh, let me just say it this way, southern Russia and parts of Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, uh, uh, just Muslim countries by and large. They're going to invade two parts of Israel. The northern part, which is up near the border of Syria and Lebanon. Hello. <laughs> and the southern, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, West Bank area, which is the country of Jordan, right along the border there, a place called the Valley of the Passengers. So don't, get, don't, don't worry about that. I just want to tell you what's in there. It says it takes them seven years to burn weapons. Now, first of all, we don't normally burn weapons unless we're dealing with nuclear, biological, getting rid of it, and it would take time to get rid of all that. Stay with me. I think this is an opinion. Time will tell. This seven-year treaty of Daniel 9.27, he will make a covenant with many for one seven or for seven years, I believe personally, is connected to after the war of Gog and Magog, and it's a treaty of burning weapons and a treaty of the land. Now, it's real weird that Ezekiel says seven years. No other place in the Bible does it use that, you know, the, you know what I'm saying? No, no other prophecy in the Bible fits the seven years except that one right there. So... Woo, hallelujah, somebody. See, and the Bible says who can make war against the beast. So if there's going to be wars involved. Okay, let's go back to this. Boy, that's a, that's a messy looking board. I hope y'all can read what I'm talking about right here. All right. So the first 42 months, although there's a treaty made, you don't see the Antichrist. You don't see him much. He's got his army. He's raising up his stuff behind the scenes. Okay? But then when he goes after Jerusalem, he is the centerpiece of the entire book of Revelation from that point on. And his kingdom, his kingdom, this is the man. The Antichrist is the man, but the beast is his kingdom. All right? Separate those two. And the beast has ten kings with him. All right? Now, Mark, come up and erase this in case I need to go back. Everybody give the Lord a hand if you kind of got what I'm talking about so far. All right? Now, let me look at scriptures on the Antichrist. And I want you to follow me. And these will not come on the screen. We didn't have time to do all the PowerPoint. So you'll have to just take notes on this. Number one, the Antichrist is going to be a man to form a final empire at the end of the age. Number two, he makes a treaty for seven years. We've talked about that. Number three, he sets up his kingdom the final 42 months in Jerusalem. This is important because all my life growing up, and the Antichrist rules for seven years. No, he makes a treaty for seven years, but he only controls the world the last 42 months. And Daniel says it this way. He controls it for time, times, and dividing of time. What on earth does that mean? Time, times, dividing of time. All right? Are you still here? Yeah. Time is one year. Times is two years. Dividing of time is half of that, which is six months. That's 42 months, three and a half years. Uh, you got it? And that's in Daniel. And so John uses the same term in the book of Revelation for a time, times, and dividing of time, and he picks it up from Daniel. All right, let's go through this real quickly. The Antichrist will eventually, uh, eventually invade Jerusalem at mid-trib, and number five, the Antichrist will be involved in a final battle called the Battle of Armageddon. Now, where did the term Antichrist come from? This is extremely intriguing. 
I thought the word antichrist was a word that existed since the beginning of the classical or Kone Greek. It is not. John, who wrote the book of Revelation, wrote the gospel of St. John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. And he coined and came up with the word antichrist. Now, here are your four verses, okay, in John's epistle that tell you what the antichrist is. Everybody say, I'm ready. Okay, 1 John 2, 18 through 19. Little children, it is the last hour, and you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have come, which we know that it's the last time. 1 John 2, 22, who is a liar, but he that denies Jesus is the Christ. He's the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. 1 John 3, 8, every spirit that does not confess Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God, and this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you've heard was coming and is now already in the world. 2 John chapter 7, for many deceivers have gone into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an Antichrist. Now, this is very important you hear this. John's definition of the Antichrist, anti can mean against Christ, okay? Anti, antichristos, against Christ. Christ, by the way, is the Greek word Christos, which means the anointed one. But it's talking about Jesus here, against Jesus. There, it's, a, it's a system against Jesus. Why is it against Jesus? Now, this is really important. The Antichrist spirit and the Antichrist man will do the following. He will deny that the deity of Jesus Christ, he denies that Jesus is the Son of God, and he denies the relationship of God the Father with Jesus Christ. Now, this is real important for you to catch this. This is important. One of my first clues of saying that the Antichrist has to be a Muslim is because in the Muslim book of the Quran, which is their holy book, it's like their Bible, and the Hadith, which is their traditions that they believe the prophet Muhammad, their prophet, taught, it says Allah. Now, you're going to hear me mention Allah tonight. Allah is an Arabic name for God, and the Muslims uh, use that name. You know, now, we, now, they say it's the same God. There's a differences of opinion as far as going back to that ancient name. Where did it really originate? Was it a moon deity? I'm not going to get into that tonight. Okay, it's too much and too complicated. But let me just say this, that they say Allah has no son. Allah is not begotten, neither does he begot. So basically, one of the main teachings of Islam. Pam, do you remember going to the, to the uh, Muhammad, was it Muhammad Ali Mosque? It was the, in Egypt. Okay, now here's, here's me and Pam. We've never been to Egypt. We've never been in a mosque in our lives, so they tell us to take our shoes off. Well, Pam's from Alabama. Bless her heart, she's just as innocent as she can be, and she walks in that mosque and says, whoo, sure does stink in here. And remember, Afifi was our guide. He said, please, 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 this is, a, this is a sacred place to me. Oh, she said, I'm sorry, I didn't want to offend nobody. So then Afifi, our guide, he's a Muslim. He sits down. He says, now, now you, you know, when I talk about Middle Eastern guys, I got to do the accent. And we do it so much in Israel, cutting up with them, that I do it automatically. He says, now, Christianity and Islam, very closely related, very closely related. Well, I didn't know anything about Islam. He said, do you fast? Yes, we fast. Do you pray? Oh, we pray five times a day. I'm thinking, well, these guys are pretty religious, you know. And he went down this list, and I promise you, I'm saying they do everything Christians do. I said, Afifi, what's the difference then? We're so close connected. You do what we do. You fast, you pray, we give. I mean, it sounds like the same. He said, only one difference. We do not believe that Jesus was crucified or resurrected. I said, that's the difference right there, boys. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the difference. I held my hand up and said, that's it. Okay? So you need to understand this because I have Muslim, and when I go to Israel, my drivers are, I'm sorry, my bus, my guides are Jews. All my drivers are either, uh, most of them are Palestinian Muslims, and I've had them for 15, 20 years. And aren't they some of the greatest guys in the world, Robbie? Hilarious. And they love me. They, you know, I don't mean this in a negative way, but they take a bullet from me. They love me that much, and I'm just saying seriously, we are very close. But let me just say this about them. I've said, okay, what do y'all believe about? Tell me about Jesus. Now, here's the Islamic belief of 1.4 billion Muslims. Most of you have never heard this. We as Christians, be, okay, the Jews, the Jews depends on what kind of a Jewish person it is, on what they believe. But when it comes to Christianity, we believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, crucified, buried, raised again on the third day, seated at the right hand of the Father. Come on, I said that right, didn't I? But here's what Islam believes. Islam says, now my brother, Brother Petty, this is what happened. That when Jesus was about to be crucified, God changed the countenance of Judas, or one of the disciples, and made him look like Jesus. So when they put Jesus on the cross, they didn't really put Jesus on the cross. They put somebody that looked like him. And God caught Jesus up into heaven and rebuked him and said, Why did you tell people you were my son when you know I have no son? And then they teach Jesus will come back at the end of days and he will have to appear in Jerusalem and tell people, God has no son. I am not the son of God. I lied. Now, wait a minute. If you not read the book of Revelation, that will go right over your head till you go to Revelation chapter 13, what I just read, 
where there's a man called the Antichrist who's a political military leader, and then there's a false prophet who comes with him posing as Jesus. Ah, oh, now it's coming together. Yeah, yeah. there's going to be a guy that has supernatural satanic power who is a lamb with two horns in the Bible symbolism. And a lamb represents Jesus, but it's not really Jesus. Two horns represent two religions. It's apostate Christianity and Islam. And he pulls the two religions together. You know how he does it in Revelation 13? This false prophet who comes with the Antichrist in the middle of the tribulation for those final 42 months, he does it by calling fire out of heaven in the sight of men. And he does it according to Revelation by building an icon. The, the, the English Bible says... An image, the Greek word is icon, of the Antichrist. And he breathes on it and makes it speak and live. And whoever does not worship the image is beheaded. Whew. Whew. Sounds like Islam to me. Are you still here? So the false prophet is the expected Esau. This Esau is the name of Jesus in, among the Muslims. But Esau ibn Meriim, Jesus the son of Mary, is supposed to appear with the Mahdi of Islam at the end of days and go to Jerusalem and tear down the crosses and kill the Jews and set up an empire. They believe in that. Now, folks, I don't know what you think. That's Revelation 13 if you've ever read, read Revelation 13. Everybody still here? Yes. How many want more? Yes. Yeah? Okay. So... One of the things that made me say, could the Antichrist empire be Islamic was because Islam's denial of Jesus being the son of God comes into play with what John said the spirit of Antichrist was. All right? Now, let's look at this and go a little bit further. I'm going to go through quickly, and this is going to be real fast. Let me believe I can talk fast. Oh, yeah. There's two apocalyptic books. Now, by apocalyptic books, I mean these are books that deal with the time of the end. One is Daniel. It has 12 chapters in it. The other is the book of Revelation. It has 22 chapters in it. And here's what I want to do. This is fascinating. I'm going to show you what Daniel predicted, and I'm going to show you what John saw. And I want to show you how these two books complement each other. Everybody ready to go? Both of them saw a final seven-year period. In Daniel 9.27, he calls it seven years covenant for seven years. But in Revelation 11.2, John divides the tribulation up into 42 months and 42 months. That's seven years. Both saw a final 42 months of history. Okay, in Daniel 12 and 7, the time frame is time, time, and dividing of time. But in Revelation chapter 12 and 6, John talks about the, the time frame of 1,260 days or three and a half years, and they're both the same. In fact, John uses the term time, times, and dividing of time. Number three, they both identified the Antichrist as a beast in Daniel chapter 7 verse Verse 7, he's the fourth beast that rises up out of the Mediterranean Sea area. In Revelation 13 and 1, John says, I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. He, they saw the same thing. John gave more details, by the way, than Daniel did. I'll talk about that in a moment. Number 4, they saw a time of great trouble coming to the earth. In the book of Daniel chapter 12 and 1, Daniel said it would be a time such as was not nor ever shall be. Revelation chapter 12, 7 through 10, the Bible says John described it as a time of wrath and trouble. Number 5, this is interesting. Both saw Michael the archangel. In Daniel 12 and 1, Daniel saw Michael the archangel standing up. And also in Revelation chapter 12 verse 7, John saw Michael the archangel kicking the devil out of heaven, out of the second heaven to the earth. Wow. Number 6, both of these prophets, Daniel and John, saw 10 kings that were going to rule at the end of days. Daniel chapter 7 verse 24, Daniel saw the 10 horns, and saw him as the 10 horns on the beast. I'll show you that in a moment. Or actually 10 kings that are coming at the end of days. Revelation 13 and 1, John said, I saw a beast with 10 horns, 10 crowns on his head. They both see the same beast. It's the Antichrist kingdom. Number 7, both saw the resurrection of the dead. Daniel 12 and 2 saw the resurrection of the dead after the tribulation. Those would be the people killed in the tribulation that are going to be raised from the dead at the end of the seven years. And then in Revelation chapter 7, 9 through 17, John saw the revelation of the resurrection of those who were beheaded during the tribulation and they are raised at the end of the seven years where they can rule and reign with Christ on earth for one thousand years all right number eight both of them saw the return of the lord to set up his kingdom daniel chapter 7 13 through 14 daniel saw the kingdom of the messiah and then john saw it in revelation chapter 19 and verse 11 he saw when christ was coming to make war now what we'd like to do is we'd like to break down now not just about the antichrist not just about the tribulation but about this kingdom and how do we know what we're telling you about 10 kings are coming and it's an eighth empire how do we know that's all in the bible all right let's go to powerpoint number two guys and this is the image of nebuchadnezzar and uh, i can't see that if someone will turn a monitor toward me hopefully i can i can because i'm not sure what pictures they put up here all right over on the left side of the screen is an image that nebuchadnezzar saw uh i'm sorry in a dream that nebuchadnezzar saw and and he saw a metallic, everybody say metallic image. 
The head was of gold, the chest and arms were of silver, the thighs were made of brass, the legs of iron, the feet were iron and part clay, and there were ten toes at the bottom that were part miry clay and iron. Now what I'd like to do is give you the definition without a doubt of, why, of these metals and what they represent. This is not just some weird dream with a metal head, you know, metal head dude. <laughs> this is a dream in which the metals represent empires that are going to rule the world from the time of Babylon till the time that Jesus comes back. And let me give them to you. Here we go. That head of gold is the Babylonian Empire. And the Babylonian Empire, of course, was symbolized by a lion in the book of Daniel. The chest and arms of silver was the empire that followed Babylon. After the Babylonians came the Medes and the Persians. They ruled for over 200 years from Babylon. After the Medes and Persians came the thighs of brass. That was the Grecian Empire with a man by the name of Alexander the Great. After Alexander the Great came uh, you have Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, then came the Roman Empire. Now notice on that image he's got two legs and the two legs are of iron. That is where Rome divided. Rome was divided between Rome, Italy and Constantinople. Constantine was an emperor of Rome in the 4th century and uh, he got a word from an early church father that Rome was going to be destroyed. And they were living in Rome, by the way, Rome, Italy. And he went over to Turkey and built a place called Constantinople, which today is called Istanbul, Turkey. And Rome is built on seven hills and Constantinople Constantinople, Turkey is built on seven hills. He called it the New Rome. And so that image that Nebuchadnezzar saw that had legs of iron, it represents the Roman Empire. That was the Iron Kingdom. And it, Rome was divided between the east and the west. The western branch was Italy, Rome, Italy, and the eastern branch was Constantinople, Turkey. And that's how it was for a thousand years. Boy, I wish I had time to preach on that and give you how all that fits out in history. Now, here's what happens. Suddenly, you come down to the bottom of this image, and it's two feet. These two feet are east and west, all right? Now, think about this for a moment. It's communism and democracy. Democracy is the clay. Communism is the iron. And for 70 years, how was it divided? East and west, just like the Roman Empire. The western branch was America, the democracy, Britain, England, France, America. The east was Russia. The east was Eastern Europe. And it was even called the Iron Curtain. Hello. And the emblem of communism was the iron sickle and hammer. So the two feet on that image is democracy and communism, which was east and west. But wait a minute. Communism started collapsing, didn't it, a few years ago? Come on, we're about to get to the last days here. Hallelujah. So where does it come to? Here's where it comes to. It ends up at the very end being ten nations with ten kings, don't miss this, who already have a kingdom before the Antichrist takes them over. Now, are those ten kings ten regions of the world? I've already heard that the global government has divided up the world into ten different regions. Canada, America, and South America are one region. Region Australia is a region to itself. They got Europe divided up. They got Africa divided up. And they've actually divided up into ten different parts. Is that, is that the ten kings? Or, or is the ten kings ten Islamic nations that the Antichrist is going to control all that surround Israel? That's a very strong possibility, and I'm going to tell you why. Everybody ready for this? Say, I'm ready. Because in the book of Daniel, he tells you that there's three nations that's going to fall in the last days. You all, want, you all know what they are? Daniel 11. Egypt, Libya, and Ethiopia. Two of the early church fathers said that there'll be ten nations in the last days. And the Antichrist will take over Egypt, Libya, and Ethiopia. And that is three of the seven, three of those ten kings he overthrows. Now, if that's true... Then these ten horns on the beast, the ten toes on Nebuchadnezzar's image, the ten horns and the ten kings are ten Muslim nations that are independent nations surrounding Israel that will give their entire nation over to the Antichrist with the hopes of wrecking and destroying the nation of Israel and taking it over from the hands of the Jews once and for all. Lord, is everybody still here? Help me preach. Now, let's go back. Can we go back and prove some of this to you? How many, say, how, many, how many of you are still with me? Some of you look like a deer in headlights. I can't tell if I've lost you. I can't tell if you're here. How many of you are still following me even though I'm preaching fast? Raise your hand. Are you following me? All right, you're doing, you're doing great. I'd have lost most people by now. You're doing good. Okay, here we go. Now I want to go back and I want to talk about this kingdom of the beast. Everybody give the Lord a praise right here before we go on. Come on, I feel like doing that. Hallelujah. Now, 
Here's where it starts getting crazy. I'm telling you, this is amazing. This is, this is amazing to me. Daniel, in the book of Daniel, describes this Antichrist empire beast as just the fourth beast. He don't tell you nothing about it. He said, well, it's an ugly looking thing, got seven heads, ten horns. Never tells you nothing. John comes along on the Isle of Patmos, 750 to 800 years later, probably 750 years later, has a vision. Then tells you exactly what this thing looks like. And when you start breaking down the clues, I can tell you where he's coming from. Woo! Everybody ready? I stood on the stand, sand of the sea, saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns, ten crowns. Now, but horns represent authority, by the way. It's authority, it's a king. A horn is a king, a kingdom, or authority in the Bible. On his heads were names of blasphemy. The beast I saw was like a leopard, and that means the body's like a leopard. Get the, get the imagery. The body's like a leopard, feet are like a bear, mouth like a lion. Well, what a weird looking creature. No, 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 because he's going back to Daniel 7. And he's giving you the imagery of three empires that Daniel saw. And let's look at them right now. First of all, who is the lion? The lion is the empire of Babylon, the Babylonian empire where Daniel was back in the time when he wrote the book of Daniel. And you can see on on the, the map there all of that red area, which would be Iraq, Syria, Lebanon. And it actually curves all the way up toward the edge of Palestine. Because Remember, the Babylonians took over Israel, didn't they? And I'm going to use the name Israel instead of Palestine because that's the modern term. It goes all the way toward Egypt. Now, the lion, he says, this beast has the mouth of a lion, right? Number two, he says, this beast has feet like a bear. Now, here's the bear empire. It came after the Babylonians, and it took up Persia, which is Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon. It goes all the way into northern Africa and up toward Turkey. Woo, it expanded, didn't it? Wait a minute, wait a minute now. But then he says, I saw the whole body of it that was like a leopard. The leopard empire came after the Medes and Persians. Now, remember, these are empires that ruled this territory we're looking at with kings, different kings. Alexander the Great was the head of Greece. He took over all the way of Afghanistan and Pakistan, all the way to the edge of India. Now, here's what's weird. Every, Every time I get to this, man, my hair starts standing up. I'm serious. Every one of these empires I'm showing you, the Babylonian lion, the Media Persian bear, and the Grecian leopard, all of them ruled from Babylon, which is today Iraq, where we've had the war all these years. Everybody know who I'm talking about? They all ruled from Babylon. All three of them did. Now, that's a clue to something. (laughs) We're going to go somewhere in just a minute. Yes, we are. Here's the areas. I want to show you where these areas are. Ready? All right. I got number four, guys. Let's show them. I'm going to show you the beast empire. It is the area of Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, edge of Saudi Arabia, uh, Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, Libya. Hello. Basically, what I'm telling you is this, that this beast empire is a combination of three historic empires in the past that come united together under one man called the Antichrist. And every nation is Muslim except, look, let's go to the map here, Charlie. This is the better map. Look here. If I take the three empires of prophecy and combine them, they ruled Pakistan, radical Islam. Afghanistan, hello, radical Islam. Iran, hello, radical Islam. They also ruled the edge of some of these southern Russian states. They ruled Armenia. They ruled Turkey. They ruled Syria. They ruled Iraq. They ruled uh, uh, the air edge of Jordan. They ruled it, controlled Israel, Egypt, all the way to Sudan, Ethiopia. Everything you're looking at, here's what's so weird, in my opinion. You start looking at that, and it don't take you long to figure out one man's going to put all that together under one leadership. Mm. And the, the clue, the clue of the kingdom and what it's named has been in the Bible the whole time and everybody's just passed right by it. There's two chapters in the book of Revelation on it. You know what it's called? It's called Babylon. Babylon don't exist. Thank you. It does not exist. There's been seven empires of Bible prophecy. That, That devil has seven heads on him. The dragon has seven heads. The seven empires, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, Rome, the seventh empire that continues for 42 months. Are you listening? And the Bible says this, the beast that was is not, but shall ascend in the future. In John's day, this this empire was dead. 
I hear preachers all the time. The Roman Empire is coming back and the Antichrist is going to rule from the EU. No, he's not. In John's day, the Roman Empire was ruling. He said this beast is one that was but is not. If it was the Roman Empire, he'd have told you it's the beast that was then. Preach on, Perry. Some of you are going to get this. Huh? Are you getting it? Let me give you another one. In the book of Revelation, it says, this, it says the, the beast had a deadly wound to one of its heads and the wound was healed. All these, all these novels, they have the shooting antichrist in the head and he gets resurrected again. And that has caused more misunderstanding of that verse. The, the, the Discovery Channel came to my office and they said, we're going to do a teaching on the antichrist and you're one of the five preachers they've asked us to interview. I said, good, bring your cameras. And they got to this part about the beast the Antichrist. They said, now the Antichrist is going to be shot in the head, right? I said, no. They said, we just interviewed four preachers that told us he was. I said, they're all four wrong. He said, stop the camera. I said, go get me a Bible. I said, now go read the Bible. First of all, it says he's got seven heads. The dragon, the beast that has seven heads and ten horns. Is that right? He said, there it is. I said, Let me, you, want to, you want to see it in the Greek? You want to see it in the English or both? He said, show me both. I said, it says one of his heads was wounded. I said, if the Antichrist is a man, a man's only got one head. It's not talking about somebody shooting him in the head and he's going to die and be resurrected like Jesus. Woo, the false prophet's going to raise him from the dead. That's somebody's theory they came up with. One of the seven previous empires of Bible prophecy is dead. But that dead empire is going to come back at the end of days and I'm going to tell you where it is. It's Iraq, where ancient Babylon was. Oh, if you don't believe me, you better stay with me because I'm going to show you something. All right, look at this, look at this. In the book of Daniel, I'm going to do this in story form. This is the best way for me to do it because I, get, I just rattle this stuff off. And Pam says, Perry, you rattle verses and you know this stuff and you've studied for 36 years. So let me just explain it this way, okay? In the Bible, it talks about the empire of the leopard. That was Alexander the Great. And it says the leopard in Daniel's vision had four heads and four wings. And it says suddenly the four wings were divided. And you're saying, what does that mean? Well, history tells you. Alexander the Great died in Babylon at age 32 to 33. There's a controversy on that. Some say 32, some say 33. But he died either of a drug overdose or somebody killed him or he died drunk. When he died, four generals, four, divided his kingdom into four parts. Hello. That's the leopard, Alexander the Great's empire, being divided by four. And I just happen to have their names here. Ptolemy took Egypt and northern Africa. Okay, that's the area today of Egypt, Libya, and northern Africa. That's the area he took. Seleucus took Assyria and Babylon. That would include Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq today. Lysimachus took Turkey and the southern part of Russia. Cassander took Greece and Macedonia, which included Greece, Bulgaria, and Romania. Now, here's what Daniel said. Here's your big clue you've been waiting for. Where's it coming from? Here it is. Out of one of them... Out of one of those four divisions will come a little horn who will wax great to the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. You only got four possibilities, ladies and gentlemen, of where the Antichrist comes from. Northern Africa, with the headquarters being Egypt, the area of Turkey, the area of Greece and Macedonia, or Syria and Iraq. Let's talk about it for a minute. Does the Antichrist arise out of Egypt? No. How do I know? Daniel chapter 11, he takes over he fights with the king of the south, which is Egypt, and takes over Egypt in the tribulation. So he doesn't come from there. He fights the king there. Does he come out of Turkey? No. How do I know? Because Turkey in the book of Daniel is the king of the north that's singing, bringing ships against him, trying to stop him. Russia is not the king of the north in the tribulation. Turkey will be the king of the north. It's an Islamic country. And they are already fighting with Syria. Hello. <clears throat> so he fights them. He takes over this and fights it. Leaves two areas. It leaves the area of Greece, which is over here, and Macedonia, which is in this area. Or it leaves the area of, excuse me, Iraq and Syria. Huh. See, Babylon was in Iraq. Oh, near Baghdad. Y'all going to get this in just a minute. It's all going to make sense to you. Bottom line is this. If you want to know where the Antichrist comes from, he comes out of Iraq, Lebanon, and Syria area. If you want to know what he does, there's going to be a shakeup in Syria. There's going to be a shakeup in Lebanon. And when that shakeup happens, it's going to leave such a void, one man will step in and take the whole area over. 
And I will, I will predict something to you. We may live to see it. We may not see it. It may not happen until the middle of the tribulation. But the Iraqis, listen, the Syrians do not want to call themselves Iraqis. The Iraqis are not going to call themselves Syrians. The Lebanese are not going to come to call themselves Iraqis because they're tribal. So they'll just rename it Babylon. Yeah. Now you're getting it. Oh, now you're getting it, okay? Yeah, they'll rename it Babylon. Saddam Hussein almost did that when he was alive. He was rebuilding Babylon, didn't make it. Dake's annotated Bible, notes from 1940. Ready? 1940, guys, before anybody knew what Islam was doing or would do in the end times. Page, page 918. One thing is certain. Babylon will be the center of activities in the east during the last days in commerce, religion, and politics. It will be rebuilt and become the capital of the Antichrist. He will come from Syria, which will take in Babylon in those days. For the Syrian division of the old Grecian Empire included all countries of Syria and Iraq. Well, shall we go ahead and go a little bit deeper into this? Let us talk about why everything here is Islamic. Because a lot of you may not know the history of Islam. You're going to get you a good... I'm going to tell you something. Uh, it, it, it costs you good money to get the information you're getting tonight if you were in a college. I'm serious because we're giving you some stuff that you don't normally get. Are you folks on the internet? By the way, this ain't going to be archived. <laughs> Ready? Here we go. I'm going to read this. This is a book I wrote some time back, but I'd rather read it than try to describe it. Listen carefully. Children, listen carefully as we read the story. Okay. The founder of the Islamic religion is Muhammad, whose name means the praise one. He was born in 570 AD and was from Arabia. He claimed a series of visions and revelations that became the basis of the Islamic holy book called the Quran. Muhammad was from the Quraysh tribe, which claimed to be direct descendants from Abraham through his son Ishmael. Muhammad's father, Abdullah, died before Muhammad was born. His mother, Amina, died when Muhammad was six. He was raised by his uncle and traveled with caravans throughout Syria and Arabia. At age 25, he married a, a, a wealthy widow by the name of Khadijah, and she and had six children through her. Now, Muhammad lived near Mecca in a settlement of Arabia. It was a community situated in the center of the northeast and western caravan routes. Arabian merchants covered the areas with bed, food, stables for camels and other services. Mecca also contained a 140-foot deep well with crystal clear water called Zamzam. The well was believed to cure illness, and it, it drew people from far and near to the area of Mecca. So Mecca is, is located in Arabia, uh, and it, I think we probably... Do we have a map of that, guys, we put up? Mecca is located in the area of Arabia. Now, here's what really draws the attention of Muslims to this day. It's called the Kaaba, which is the black stone. Okay? Another distinguishing mark of Mecca was a large black rock, different from all others in the area. No one knew how it got there, and the caravans were afraid of it. It was probably a large meteorite. Those living in Mecca built a large cube-shaped stone over the rock called the Kaaba, meaning the cube in Arabic. The local people charged visitors to kiss the rock for good luck. Now, let me go through this list. This is real important. Before Muhammad's time, Muhammad, Mecca became a tourist attraction for the caravans. Each year, pilgrims traveled to Mecca to drink the special spring water and kiss the black stone. On the, on the stone were different gods and goddesses placed there by the inhabitants of Mecca. Muhammad's grandfather was the keeper of the keys to the Kaaba. By the 5th century, the tribe of Quraysh were the guardians of the black stone and were the dominant tribe in Mecca. By, at, at age 40, Muhammad began fasting and praying and in the year 610, he was in a cave in which he heard a voice. He heard this voice, wrapped himself in a blanket at home, and his, he said he had seen, uh, experienced a demon manifestation, but his wife told him it was an angel of the Lord. So he goes back up into the cave, and he begins to receive what he calls visitations from the angel Gabriel. His early messages consisted of God's goodness and power, the need to return to God and destroy the idols. He declared there was one God whose name in the Arabic was Allah. The, his religion became Islam, which, mean, which meant submission. Uh, but suddenly, when he began to call himself a prophet, both the Jews and the Christians did not receive him as a prophet. And so the latter half of the Quran are the war verses. And there began to be a battle against Jews and Christians who did not receive him. And he began to kill Jewish tribes and Christian groups in the area of Arabia. He had to eventually flee to the area of Medina because they ran him out of, of uh, Mecca. But he formed an army, came back to Mecca, took the entire thing over, got rid of all the idol gods. They actually had 360 gods on the black stone that they were worshiping. He got rid of all of them and said there was only one God by the name of Allah. So this is the beginning of the Islamic religion. It became known as the religion of the Arabs or the religion of the Arabic-speaking people. But it was his death, somebody say his death, that caused a division. He had married a very, very young Jewish girl. 
In fact, I think he was probably, I don't want to get wrong on this, but he may have been in his 50s or so, and the girl was about 17 years of age. He marries this girl, and this particular girl was Jewish, and she didn't believe he was a prophet. She believed he was lying, so she wanted to test it. The Muslims tell a story of how uh, Muhammad was eating the leg of a lamb, and she poisoned the leg of the lamb. His friend ate it and died. Muhammad ate it and got sick, but he had trouble, stomach trouble the rest of his life because of it, and later on he would die, not immediately, but later on. So they accused a Jewish woman of killing him, and that is one of the reasons that one guy told me that there's always been an animosity with Jewish people because they felt like that a Jewish woman may have killed Muhammad. That's just one story, by the way, uh, just of many that uh, may have bearing or not. Muhammad's elders, after his death, elected Muhammad's second convert. Now, we're going somewhere with this. This is about to get real interesting, so stay with me. You've got to get the history first. Muhammad's second convert and his oldest man in the group by the name of Abu Bakr. The small group believed... The, a smaller group of Muslims, however, believed that Ali, Muhammad's adopted son, who married Fatima, his daughter, should be the replacement for Muhammad. All of a sudden, <laughs> just like good old religious folks, they start fighting each other. Come on, somebody, help me preach right there. So they formed two groups. The larger group was called the Sunnis, Sunni, and the smaller group was called the Shia, Shia, the Shia group. So the two branches, one group goes with Abu, one group goes with Ali. They both claim to have the revelation of the prophet. They both, both claim to be the true group. And when you have a competition with another group, what do you do in that day when you're in Arabia? You just start killing everybody. So here's what they did. Now, I'm telling you something that really is honestly quite amazing when you begin to think about it. But these individuals began to kill each other off. So it goes something like this. Now, what I'm about to tell you is where a story began in 1992 with me with a girl from Iran whose family was Shia Muslim. You remember Ellie Pam? She went to the house and told me that everything. In 1992, now how many years ago is that? It's 21 years ago, right? I started teaching something, and I promise you the only man ever teaching it at that time that I knew was George Otis, who wrote a book on uh, something about the last of the giants. And I couldn't, when I read his book, I said, that's exactly it. I started teaching that, now watch me, that, the Sunnis and the Shias are in a battle. And this girl from Iran told me this. She says, Perry, my family's from Iran. You preached tonight. I was in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. She said, you preached tonight from Revelation 13. You said an Antichrist was coming and a false prophet was coming. I said, that's right. You said the Antichrist is military, but the false prophet's going to be a false Jesus. I said, that's right. She said, that's what the Shia Muslims have been teaching for years, for centuries. I said, what? They teach in Revelation? No, she said, no, no, no. She said, let me tell you what we were taught. The Shia, okay, the Shia Muslims make up about 98% of the Muslim population. Everything else around here is Sunni. Sunnis are 80%. Shias are 20% of the Islamic population. But all of this is what I'm about to tell you. She said in Iraq years ago, when the religion split, it split between the Sunnis and the Shias. She said the, the Sunnis killed, murdered, beheaded, poisoned the first 11 leaders of the Shia branch of Islam. I said, what? One after the other. They'd raise up one, bam, have a battle and kill him. Raise up one, bam. She says, as a matter of fact, in Karbala, Iraq, Ali was killed, no, Abu was killed with 70 of his followers. 70. I said, all right, what does that mean? She says, here's what it means. The 12th son of number 11, they were afraid they were going to kill him. So they took him in a city and stuck him in a well. There was a cave near a well, and they hid him in there, and he never came out. I said, well, you think he died? They said they never found his grave. I said, well, so what's that mean? She said, it started a tradition. It's called the tradition of the Twelve, or better known as the Arise of the Mahdi. And I said, Maha what? I never heard that term. She says, no, but let me tell you what they teach us in Iran. They teach us that at the end of days... The Mahdi, the awaited one, the enlightened one, is going to arise. When he arises, he will arise. Now, they've changed it since then because they've had a war with Iraq, but the original teaching was he will arise out of the country of Iraq. When he arises out of Iraq, he will go into Mecca to Saudi Arabia during the Hajj where all the Muslims go once a year. He will raise his hand. A light will appear out of his hand. He will end up in Damascus where Jesus will team up with him and they will eventually go to Jerusalem and kill all Christians and all Jews and take the whole place over for Islam. And this man called the Mahdi is going to form the last caliph of world history and accompanying him will be Jesus. Revelation 13, an antichrist that rises up out of the sea that makes war 
Revelation 13, 11, a false prophet with a lamb, that's a lamb with two horns. Come on, are you listening? She said, when you said tonight there was an antichrist and a false prophet, that's, that's exactly what they're looking for. But they don't call it an antichrist and false prophet. It is a man who's going to reorganize all of Islam under his power and influence, and he will have somebody representing Jesus. She says, don't you understand? She's just, I'm, pardon me, she's freaking me out. I mean, I knew what I preached. I knew nothing about Mahadi. But here's where it gets really, really bizarre. Now, stay with me. Not only do the Shias believe that he comes out of Iraq, the Sunnis believe he comes out of Iraq. Karbala, Iraq, Samara, Iraq. There are two locations where these two religions believe. Now, let me just tell you how weird this gets. Anybody want to hear how weird this gets? Say, I want to hear. All right. We go in there to Iraq to remove Saddam Hussein, right? Oh, I could get into some intelligence stuff right there, and I'm going to leave that alone. Dear Lord, help me. I get in trouble. Anyway, we go in there to remove him out of office, right? He's removed. But here's what's weird. Can I, okay, is it just me, or has anybody, anybody ever asked yourself a question? How come these Muslims keep killing each other? Talk to me. You ever, anybody watch the news? A Muslim blew up a Muslim mosque. A Muslim blew up a Muslim mosque. Would you pray tell me what's going on? Here we go. They are battling over whose prophecies are right. Because one group since the 9th and 10th century says the Mahdi has to come from here. The other group says, no, the Mahdi has to come from here. So when we were in the Gulf War and the war was over, a group of Sunnis blew up a Shiite mosque where the 12th boy was supposed to be hidden to keep him from appearing. And a year later, or a couple months later, the, the, the other group of Muslims went to the other town where the Mahdi is supposed to appear and blew that mosque up. And the reason they keep killing each other, you better listen to me, is because they're fighting over their own prophecies to if the Sunnis are right or if the Shiites are right and they're going to keep killing each other till somebody rises to power and says, I'm the Mahdi. And listen to me. My Muslim friends, I can look, I tell my Muslim friends exactly what I'm preaching. I've taught it right there while I'm preaching for manifest and they're sitting there as my bus driver's watching. I said, look, I know you guys may disagree with me. He said, no, brother, this is very interesting. My God, my God, this is very interesting. I've had two, two of them told me this. We've never heard nothing like this. We've never heard nothing like this. And I said, I don't mean this. I'm not insulting you. I don't even want to sound like that. But I said, it appears to me that whoever this man is that you're expecting fulfills the prophecies in the Bible of the Antichrist. Do you want me to tell you the first thing Ellie told me? She says, do you know how that man is supposed to come? I said, I have no idea. Riding a white horse. I said, oh, dear Lord, Revelation chapter 6, when Jesus breaks the first seal in heaven, there's a white horse rider with a bow riding like he's making peace. She said, thank you. The whole thing about the Mahdi is they teach us peace and justice, peace and justice will come to the earth and he will come riding on a white horse. Gaddafi had a white horse. Mubarak had a white horse. Saddam Hussein had a white horse. The kings of Arabia have white horses. Bin Laden has a son that has a white horse. Every major Arabic leader in the world who's a Muslim has a white horse because they think they could be called to be the Mahdi. Is anybody listening? And the reason those guys at Gitmo followed Bin Laden, they found a board where Bin Laden was writing in Arabic, the Mahdi, and the Mahdi is supposed to be hiding in a cave, according to some traditions, and he can take on a war on the West and defeat the West, and Bin Laden thought he was the Mahdi, and that's why he hid in a cave, and that's why he had all those people following him, because those people thought he took down America, he took down the West, and the big sign of the end time among the Muslims is the West will be defeated in a war. Is anybody listening to me now? That's why they followed him. That's why the Mujahideen followed him. They found a board. The U.S. intelligence did. He's writing on a board in Arabic. Mahdi, the awaited one, and calling himself that. There's dudes at Gitmo when they interviewed him. Why did you follow him? Because he was the expected one. Are y'all listening? Is this interesting to anybody besides me? So here's the point. The reason they're still fighting each other, they don't get along. Listen, they haven't got along from that. They haven't got along from Muhammad's death. You know what the Bible says? Can I give you this verse? Yes, I'm going to give it to you anyway. In the book of Genesis, it says, you're going to have a child and call his name Ishmael because the Lord has heard your affliction. He'll be a wild man and his hand will be against every man. 
The DNA of that part of the world of the sons of Ishmael, according to God himself, is they are going to fight each other and their hands are going to be continuing. And by the way, I'm not being crude here, but the word wild in Hebrew means wild ass. Wild donkey. He'll be a wild donkey of a man. If you ever, I met a wild donkey in Israel one time. You don't want to get within five feet of him. They'll kick, stomp, and do all kinds of other stuff. Okay, she says he comes on a white horse. Number two, guess, hey, 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 hey. Guess how Muslims kill people? Beheading. What does Revelation 20 say? I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the testimony for the word of God which they held. Woo-hoo. Listen to what the Bible says about the Antichrist. He'll speak great words against the Most High. He'll wear out the saints of the Most High God. He'll think to change times and laws. They'll be given into his hand for time, times, and dividing a time. The Most High, changing times can allude to changing the calendar. Changing the laws can actually refer to, and I've got the Arabic word here, da'ath. It can mean, it can allude to changing religious laws. Let me just say it this way. Muslims worship on a Friday. If they convert the world to Islam, there is no more Saturday and Sunday. You go to Friday and you worship like them. That's changing the religion. Changing the law, the second thing they do is they change the calendar. They're not on the same calendar we do. An Islamic calendar started in 622 with Muhammad. And they're on a lunar solar calendar and we're on a solar calendar and they would change the calendar and they would change the religion. You say, well, Brother Stone, I just don't know if that's going to happen. I just don't, you know, I'm not just sure if that's going to happen. Well, let me just talk to you here for a moment. According to the rule of the Mahdi, here is a quote from a leading Muslim. The prophet Muhammad said that the Mahdi will fill the earth with equality and justice as it was filled with oppression and tyranny. And he will rule for seven years. Muhammad says the Mahdi will rule for seven years. And in Daniel 9, 27, he makes a covenant with many for seven years. I think that's a good place to hoop, holler, shout, do something. Because that kind of confirms what we're talking about here. <laughs> give, me one, give me one minute to sum it up. So here's a summary. Here's a summary. Let's go back to it again. Can I go back to my board? Charlie, do I have time to do this? Nod at me, son. Shout, do something. Oh, yes. Y'all give me, about, y'all give me three more minutes. All right, let's go back over it. Well, I got a blue marker now. I hope it shows up. Time of the end. There is no such thing as the end of time. Not in our time. End of time is a misnomer. We say all the time, what's the end of time? No, it's time of the end. Time of the end is going to be followed by specific signs. Okay? Mention your Bible. (laughs) There's going to be Natural signs, cosmic signs, world war signs, global signs. The two church signs are Holy Spirit being poured out and the gospel being preached. That's the only two we have to fulfill right there, okay? When these signs are full, meaning they all start happening at one time, there is a real, Acts chapter 3, there's a release from Jesus from heaven when the restitution of all things has taken place. And I'm just going to write this word down, and I know I get more hate mail. But I, can you believe this? I got a 10-hour teaching on the rapture in case you don't believe it. <laughs> and if you don't believe it after that, you can just stay when we're gone, okay? That's just how... <laughs> no, 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 nothing, nothing going to convince you at that point. You know, you're just, you're just beyond hope. All right? Rapture about Revelation chapter 4 is the time frame, okay? Then, seven-year tribulation in which it's divided into a group that's in heaven and a group that's on earth talked about that earlier. Everybody still got that in your head? Then at the end of this is the return of the Lord for the the kingdom. Return to the earth. There it is. This is just too much fun up here. I just want you to... Okay. Then this is followed by a 1,000 year reign and this is in Revelation 20. Can you imagine living a thousand years and never getting old? I'm going to be good looking then. I'm going I'm to have Jesus change my body. I'm gonna, y'all, y'all, don't, y'all don't even want to see me in the millennium. Lord Jesus. All right. I'm going to have a permanent tan. If a soul can get a tan and a spirit, I'm going to have a tan. So white skin, Irish white skin or something. At the end of the thousand years, there's a, there's a judgment. I'm going to put judgment at the great GWT, great white throne in heaven. Okay. That's in, also found in the book of Revelation. All right, and then you have new heaven, new earth. New heaven and new earth. And this is where you get into this great big word called E T E R N. And I'm sure you can read that. 
It's called, that's eternity. Woo! Now, where are we at? Where are we at? We're right here, right now. But everything you see happening in Europe, Israel, and the world is called, this is the term used by Paul, fullness of times. Okay? What does that mean? Here's what it means. I want to close with this. It means that all of us here, and I want to talk to you for just a minute. All of us here have a set time to do what we're going to do. Either a set time in our lifespan. I don't know when I'm leaving this world. You don't either. It's okay. We all got a set time to do what we got to do. Here's what it means. All of us have got to start focusing on what we're doing for the work of God here and accelerate it. Because we don't have forever. Okay. So we've all got a set time. Number two, we all have a set assignment. Look, every one of you are important. Some of you just haven't found your assignment yet. Some of you haven't found that place. Keep looking. Keep believing. God may be training you for, for something later, but you're just not ready for it. You'd be overwhelmed with it. All right? And the third thing is, I want to say this to this body, as long. Whew, my God, I feel so. As long as we love each other and love people, we will do nothing but be a blessing to people and grow as a body. See it. It's a bottom line. It's a bottom line. Bow your head. Let's pray right now. Larry, come on to the keyboards if you want to, brother. Thank you, Father, for this word today. Oh, my. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Lord, these are things that we've searched out, we've looked at. We've tried to dig out of your word. We believe it's sound. We believe it's correct. And I just want to thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name for this night. I want to thank you for every person that's here. Whew, hallelujah. I want you to, I want you, I'm going to ask a question. Keep your head bowed for a moment. We're going to do this a little bit different. Is there anybody here that's away from the Lord? You say, Perry, I've served the Lord, but I, I know I've drifted away from him in my personal life. Let me see your hand. Hold it up real high. If there's anybody here tonight that says, I've drifted away from God. Okay. How many of you have, you know what, let's just do this. Let me just, let me just pray in the Holy Ghost. Come on for a minute. Everybody lift your hands. Let's do this for a minute. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Keep your hand up, raised. I just feel the Lord have one minute somebody tell you, tell say this to you. The, the, the Lord dropped this scripture in my spirit just now. It rains on the just and the unjust. And I'm gonna to talk to you for about 30 seconds. There are times bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people. And there are things that will happen. I don't know who this is for, but you'll get this. There are things that will happen to you that you cannot explain. And you'll want to know how come the Lord didn't either prevent it or warn you of it. Okay? And the bottom line is you live on an earth with a cursed earth with mean people. And there are times that just mean people do mean things. And there wasn't a thing I could do about it. There wasn't a thing you could do about it. I've had things, Pam and I've had personal things happen to us with attacks from people. We didn't know it was coming. But we, there wasn't a thing we could do about it. It just came. And what you have to do is God will give you an experience from it. You'll learn from it. He'll give you an experience. And then what he'll do, I felt something right there, glory to God. And then he'll show you the way of escape. And the way of escape may be a plan that you did not have before that you can use to stop what the enemy is going to try to do or has tried to do in your life in the future. So I don't know who that's for. Take it right now in Jesus' name and say, Lord, I receive that. God, thank you for the wisdom of God and the Holy Ghost.